Welcome to part four of the Smart PM video series. Today's program focuses on venous catheter selection, care, and complication prevention. My name is Pat Worthington. I'm a nutritional support clinical nurse specialist at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'd like to point out that Aspen does not endorse any products that may appear during this presentation. This is a scenario that we all commonly encounter. The pharmacy receives an order to begin parenteral nutrition for a patient. The PN indication appears to be appropriate, but what about the vascular access? There are many options for vascular access available to us, each with distinct advantages and disadvantages. Many factors come into play in the decision, which we'll take a look at as we go along. But it's important to keep in mind that the selection of the most appropriate vascular access is the foundation for safe and effective PN therapy. Decisions regarding the most appropriate vascular access device should be individualized based on a number of patient-centered criteria. And these include the healthcare setting where PN therapy will take place, the risks versus benefits of each device, and clinical factors such as the presence of an infection, the need for concurrent IV therapies, or the presence of a condition such as renal failure where it's important to preserve the upper extremity veins in case that dialysis is needed in the future. The patient's developmental stage is another factor. What works for an adult may be totally inappropriate for a baby or a child. The anticipated duration of therapy is a factor and the complexity of post-insertion care should be taken into consideration. For long-term TPN, the patient's views concerning what type of device they would like is also an important consideration in this decision. And now let's go back to our scenario. Remember the PN indication seemed appropriate, but now you learn that the patient has only a peripheral IV. And that raises the question, is PN administration by peripheral vein ever appropriate? Historically, peripheral PN or PPN has been viewed unfavorably because formulations are often hypochloric. This is due to the osmolarity limits imposed by peripheral veins, and it stands out as the primary disadvantage of PPN. On the other hand, PPN has the advantage of avoiding the need for a central line, which has become an important priority in today's healthcare environment. In addition, the current Osmolality limit of 900 milliosmoles per liter allows better nutrient provision than we were able to do in the past, but PPN still requires relatively large fluid volumes and the formulation cannot be concentrated. The osmolality constraints still restrict the electrolyte content of the formulations and a frequently overlooked but fundamental component is that PPN requires adequate venous integrity. So what recommendations can we make about the appropriate use of PPN? First, PPN should be used to prevent rather than correct nutritional deficits. It's important for clinicians to conduct an assessment of protein and energy needs before starting PPN. In some cases, PPN can meet patients' needs, but we want to make sure that we're not underfeeding patients. Consider PPN as a bridge therapy during transitions, for example, when oral or enteral intake is suboptimal, when there's a need to avoid central venous catheter placement, for example, in patients who have fever or coagulopathy, or when the anticipated duration of PPN is no more than 10 to 14 days. We want to avoid PPN in home care due to the difficulty of maintaining IV access, and there's, there's an interesting question about whether or not a midline catheter, which has a longer dwell time than a traditional IV, would serve as a good option for PPN. However, that question requires further study, and we really don't have an answer at this point. Now let's look at guidelines for choosing the most appropriate vascular access for central PN. There's a few general principles that apply. Choose the smallest device with the fewest number of lumens that will meet the patient's infusion needs. Dedicate one lumen of the device for PN administration whenever possible. And this serves two purposes. First, it decreases the amount of manipulation the line will receive. And second, it avoids co-infusion of potentially incompatible medications with a complex PN formulation. There's, there's no need to insert a new line for PN. And finally, the tip of the catheter should rest in the distal superior vena cava at the junction between the vena cava and the right atrium. 
As I noted earlier, there are many options available for vascular access for administering central PN. And we're going to, we will go over a few of them here. First is the percutaneous non-tunneled central catheter. These can be inserted easily at the bedside and replaced over a guide wire if needed. They're most appropriate for use in acute care settings, and they're the preferred access for up to about 14 days. However, they're not suited for home care. They require sutures or a securement device to prevent dislodgement, and they carry a high risk for catheter-related infections. Next is the tunneled cuffed catheter. These are catheters most frequently referred to as Hickman or Broviac type catheters. They're placed surgically or with fluoroscopic guidance, and they're inserted through a tunnel, a subcutaneous tunnel on the chest wall. There's a Dacron cuff under the skin that adheres to the subcutaneous tissue. And the primary advantage of these catheters is that the cuff within the tunnel may decrease the risk of infection from migrating organisms along the outside of the catheter, and it helps to prevent dislodgement. There's no restrictions on upper extremity activity, and the, posi the position of the catheter on the chest wall facilitates self-care. It can be easily hidden under clothing as well. These are best used for long-term TPN, three months up to years. The disadvantage of these devices is that they require a surgical procedure at the bedside or in an outpatient suite for removal. And that can be a big disadvantage to patients who are at home on TPN. So this is an illustration of a percutaneous non-tunneled catheter. You can see this one is a double lumen device and it uses a, an approach through the subclavian vein, which is common, but you also see these catheters placed through the internal jugular vein that you see there in the neck. Here's an illustration of a tunneled cuffed catheter. The dotted portion that you see on the chest wall represents the subcutaneous tunnel with the small cuff there at the end. This is a single lumen device also using a subclavian approach, but an internal jugular approach is also possible with this type of device. Now we come to two more categories of central lines. The first is the peripherally inserted central catheter. These devices have become really common through on all healthcare settings, largely due to the ease and safety with which they can be inserted and removed. They are appropriate for short and medium term TPN, and they can be removed simply either at the bedside or even at home when the line is no longer needed. The key disadvantage of a PICC line is that it increases the risk for upper extremity deep vein thrombosis. The, in addition to that, the antecubital placement of the insertion site hinders self-care. It's hard for the patient to manage dressing procedures when one of their hand, using just one hand. And in some cases, there may be activity restrictions on the arm that has the line in place. So that, that can be a big disadvantage for certain patients. Finally, we come to implanted ports. With an implanted port, the central catheter is attached to a chamber that's, that's inserted into a pocket in, into the subcutaneous tissue, usually on the chest wall. These devices are ideal for low frequency intermittent access, and they carry the lowest risk for central line infection, primarily because they're covered by a skin barrier and not open to the environment. These are suitable for PN in selected circumstances. Motivated patients can learn access procedures. With, with ports, the body image remains intact because nothing is visible when the line is not accessed, and it requires no local site care when the device is not accessed. The biggest disadvantage of the, of the device of a an implanted port is that needle access is required. So for daily use, this procedure can be difficult for many patients. Dislodgement of this needle can result in infiltration, so that's a risk factor. The need for an indwelling catheter for continuous or daily TPN generally offsets the reduced infection benefit because now you have a needle that's, that's exposed to the outside environment. Ports require surgical, a surgical procedure for removal. So if there's a high infection rate, physicians will be reluctant to insert a port with the idea that the patient will, will need this to be removed potentially in a short time in the future. This drawing shows a PICC line. 
Notice how far this catheter travels within the vein to reach the central venous circulation. This is the biggest difference between this device and other types of central venous catheters. Despite all the advantages that PICC lines bring, it would not be accurate to assume that they represent the gold standard for IV therapy. This is because PICC lines pose a greater risk for deep vein thrombosis than other types of central lines. This can be a serious complication. Upper extremity thrombosis can lead to pulmonary embolism, and patients with upper extremity DVT may require therapeutic anticoagulation for several months. For patients who are PN dependent, repeated episodes of thrombosis can lead to the loss of sites for vascular access, which is a common reason for referral to, to small bowel transplant centers. Here we have an implanted port. The dotted portion of the drawing represents the portion of the device that's under the skin. This also depicts a single lumen port, but they're available in double lumen where you have two chambers that are side by side. Let's move on to central venous catheter complications. In general, these problems can be divided into two categories, those related to the insertion of the device and problems that arise during the maintenance phase of care. In terms of insertion-related complications, the first we see are bloodstream infections that occur in the first five days after insertion. These infections are thought to occur due to breaks in technique during, during the insertion itself. And they're much less common now with the development of very explicit insertion guidelines. You may have heard of insertion bundles, and they spell out a series of steps that should be in place during insertion, and they've made this type of infection much less common. Injuries can occur during insertion, such as pneumothorax or arterial puncture, and these risks have been reduced with the widespread use of ultrasound for insertion. Catheter tip placement occurs with a certain amount of frequency, and although it's not immediately dangerous to the patient, it does require repositioning of the catheter and an unnecessary manipulation, which could lead to complications down the road. In terms of maintenance complications, the greatest risk we have is bloodstream infection that occurs more than five days after infection. In this case, the bacteria, rather than migrating along the outside of the catheter, are actually found in the lumen of the catheter, and that's the mechanism of infection. About 72% of central line infections occur through contamination of the hub and an internal migration of organisms. This highlights the importance of hand hygiene, and aseptic management of the hub and injection ports, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. Finally, there are mechanical complications which can occur at any time during, during the life of the line, and these can include catheter occlusion, which may respond to treatment, or breakage, which probably results in the need to change the line. So now let's turn attention to preventing these complications associated with central lines. On the slide, you see several categories of, of intervention that are designed to prevent specific com complications. The first component is review the necessity of the line. In acute care, this is, occurs on a daily basis, but for those of us who are involved in nutritional support, it also means we need to ensure prompt transition to oral and enteral intake to avoid excess PN days. Then we have management of the infusion system. This in involves the tubing and the connections, and the primary intervention is to be consistent with adherence to hand hygiene practices. We need to avoid manipulation or disconnect disconnection of the line for routine care or ambulation. Change the PN administration tubing every 24 hours, which is more frequently than is done for standard IV therapy. And consider a prohibition on blood drawing for PN recipients, which represents a really high risk form of manipulation of the system. There's next, care of the insertion site. In, in recent years, we've shifted from skin antisepsis with povidone iodine to chlorhexidine, which seems to have a significant beneficial impact on central line infections. And there, in acute care, particularly in ICU, chlorhexidine bathing is done to prevent central line catheter infection. 
Sterile dressing should be in place on all lines. Transparent dressings are pretty much the standard of care and they're changed every seven days. If the patient can't tolerate a transparent dressing, gauze would be used and they need to be changed every two days or if the dressing is compromised, loose, moist, or with drainage. It's better to use a securement device than than sutures if possible because they can serve as a nidus for infection. And if central line infection rates remain high despite all these standard measures, you might want to consider using a chlorhexidine patch or a dressing with a chlorhexidine square embedded in it. Finally, care of injection ports and the catheter hub. This is the most specific intervention to prevent that internal contamination that I talked about. All ports should be cleansed and needless adapters should also be sterilized using alcohol or chlorhexidine with every access. These are known as scrub the hub protocols and you'll hear them talked about. In cases where infection rates remain elevated despite these measures. They now make caps that are impregnated with alcohol, which could serve as passive disinfection for, for the catheter hub and needleless adapters. As in terms of flushing and locking catheters, most organizations have pretty much standardized flushing protocols in place with saline or heparinized saline. We use heparin much less now due to concerns about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. All PN and administration tubing should be flushed be with saline before and after medications are given, before and after the parental nutrition is initiated. And then consider using an ethanol lock for selected PN recipients who are at high risk for infection complications. And this is very commonly used in patients and pediatric patients and babies who are on long-term parental nutrition. So to summarize what we've talked about today, I'd like to highlight three points. First, selection of the appropriate vascular access device for parental nutrition is the key to safe and effective therapy. Decisions regarding the choice of vascular access device should be based on many patient-centered criteria and proper vascular access device placement and vigilant maintenance is associated with fewer complications. We've provided references here for further information on the topics that we've discussed today. This educational offering was provided to you by Aspen and supported by an educational grant provided by Baxter Healthcare. I invite you to learn more about Aspen and the resources available to you by visiting the websites that you see on this slide. Thank you.